something. Ever since a little kid, it's always been one that uh, just I remember catching my ears, and it just makes you feel like marching or stomping along the way, and you almost want to sing it with a staccato type thing. And you kids were rocking it. I was hearing you above everyone, so keep it up. Great job. We live in a world that depends on predictable and unchanging measurements. There, there are government agencies whose sole purpose is to test various devices that companies have and make sure they're being honest about the measurements that are used in what they sell. So some examples, if you go to a gas pump, right, you're going to see a seal. And on that seal, it shows that some state agency has confirmed that that pump gives exactly one gallon. Imagine if you were to go and buy a gallon of gas and find you only got three-fourths of a gallon. You would be pretty angry. The population would go crazy. Um, another one is the Food and Drug Administration has a division that spends time inspecting pharmaceutical companies. They're trying to make sure that when a drug says it has a thousand milligrams, it has precisely that amount. You don't want to be going around and finding out that anything other than that is the amount. You know, every thousand milligrams, for those who like metrics, should exactly equal one gram. And you can imagine what would happen if a drug company said, eh, just do what you want. There would be terrible health problems if the dosage was wrong in every type of medication that was used out there. The building industry is also regulated by inspectors who try who go out to determine that 12 inches equals one foot. You can imagine that. That would be horrendous. Imagine the falsiness of buildings if that was, eh, give or take a couple inches here or there. It'll work itself out. And we could go on and on. Um, there are so many different areas of this world that any variability would have huge negative impacts. But the importance of predictability and unchanging measurements also applies in the spirit world. God has set spiritual measurements for how we are to live which require our personal involvement, participation, effort to achieve. And as Christians we must measure up to what God wants us to be. Okay, so what would that require? There are measurements that we find in the Word of God that point out the way we're to live. I always enjoy little formula verses. And so I'm going to focus on this next one. If you will turn to 1 Timothy 6, verse 10 through 12. This will be our anchor and then we'll bounce around some. But 1 Timothy 6, 10 through 12. The text we're about to read is written by Paul to Timothy in what's called the pastoral epistles which basically means it emphasizes what's required in spiritual leadership and what should be taught in spiritual leadership. And I hope all of you can quickly make that association that as Christians it's important that all of us understand that every one of us aspiring to be in the kingdom of God is designated to be a spiritual leader. And if you look at the le word leader bothers you, Christ made very clear leader is a servant you are to be a spiritual servant. This applies very much to us. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now you notice in verse 11 it starts with the words but you. So it's showing there's supposed to be this marked contrast in this situation directly between Timothy and false teachers that were mentioned by Paul in the earlier verses. But likewise we as Christians are not to follow the ways or the attitudes of the world either. All of us are to follow the ways and the attitudes of God. Now, Paul was intentionally trying to get Timothy's attention. In verse 11, he gave Timothy a new name, man of God. Now, he wasn't saying, ah, stop telling everybody this is your name, say, hi, I'm man of God. No, he is saying more along the lines that Timothy should live up to being a person associated with God. It's a title or description of his character. And it's quite a title. 
a lot of the famous people in the Old Testament were described that way. You could look at Moses and Elijah and David. So Timothy was in good company. But again, bring yourself into this one. We share the same calling they do. Like Timothy, Paul is exhorting us to be faithful to God in spite of the opposition, in spite of the difficulties that we will face as spiritual leaders. So today we're going to review the three instructions that Paul used in this short area of scripture. Things that are required for us to be spiritual servants, to be spiritual leaders. First is this, a spiritual leader is measured by what they flee from. A spiritual leader is measured by what they flee from. Paul wrote, but you, man of God, flee from these things. So he was actually referencing back to things that he said even before this verse. Run like the wind. There's another way you could put that. And there are times when running away is a mark of cowardice, right? But there's also times where running away is a mark of wisdom, and it means victory. You can look at the example of Joseph, right, in the Old Testament, running from Potiphar's wife. Many examples like that. And so when Paul was writing these words to Timothy, what he used is a Greek word that's pronounced fuge. It's spelled P-H-U-E-U-G-O, um, which we get the English word fugitive from. So the Greek word translated into English as flee doesn't literally mean running. It means to seek safety by flight. It's referring to separation. We're to flee from something because it's abhorrent to us. So as a man or a woman of God, as a spiritual leader, our life should display traits opposite of the world around us. And like many of the commands we're going to read in this, this section, the word we're looking at here, the verb is in the present, present imperative. What that means is continuing action, right? So really, if you were to read that, it's implying keep on running, keep on fleeing, keep on separating. Lifelong is what it's referring to. We're to make separation our habit. And just like a parent will see their kid going near a hot stove or a fire, and they'll say, get away from that. God is saying at the same time, flee godliness. Because rarely do we win a battle with a single act of resistance. It's something that takes ongoing continuance, right? So we're measured by the things we flee from. And in the context of this one verse, what we're, what's described here is fleeing against greed. Now, at the end of the day, a person is never going to be measured by how many hours they spent on a job, how much money they've earned, how many possessions they have. So we discover in fleeing evil things that God will bless us. That's how we learn. And Paul is introducing a subject he started talking about a few, inches, a few verses before. So start in verse 6 and let's read up to this point. In verse 6, and I'm going to read this from the Bible in basic English. It says, But true faith, with peace of mind, is of great profit. For we came into the world with nothing, and we are not able to take anything out. But if we have food and a roof over us, let that be enough. But those who have a desire for wealth are falling into danger and are taking as in a net by a number of foolish and damaging desires through which men are overtaken by death and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all evil. And some whose hearts were fixed on it have been turned away from the faith and been wounded with innumerable sorrows. So let me first clarify something that I hope you all understand. The Bible gives many examples of wealthy, righteous people, right? It's less about having money compared to the obsessive desire. See how much the desire was mentioned there? The obsession, the love, the priority for wealth. As the famous uh, Roman philosopher Seneca said, poverty isn't having too little, it's wanting more. And that's quite telling. But it really, it's, it's the mindset it's a trap, and greed puts human on a maddening treadmill. Think of hamsters on a wheel, and that's what greed does. Let me give you an example of how this happens in our country. In America, everyone tends to live in a particular socioeconomic bracket, right? So 
once you're able to afford living in a particular neighborhood, then you live there and you send your children to the schools there and you participate in the social life around that. But what that tends to do next is we look around and we see people around us who have more money than we do. It's just what happens in socio brackets. The human heart always wants to justify itself and this is one of those easy ways that I don't live as well as he does or she does or they do. My means are modest compared to them. We don't compare ourselves to the rest of the world. If you look around, all of us here are in the top, in smallest percentiles of this world in history. We're all very, very blessed. We all fight these areas. Please turn to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22. There are, le there are several places in the New Testament that say flee from, so we're going to look at more. We could also have gone back in the writings of Timothy and see other things, but let's focus on the word specifically where the Bible says flee from this. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22. And in essence, all of the flee from statements are avoiding pursuing anything more than God. That's what they come down to at the heart. Now, I would like you to look at, in this particular verse, we're going to read the structure. Because Paul structures the advice very similarly to what we just read. He says, flee from this, pursue that. Interesting connection here. 2 Timothy 2 verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, we're going to refer back to the four things he said to pursue later, because uh, that's another part of what we'll look into. But I will highlight one thing. The words righteousness, faith, and love are also mentioned in 1 Timothy 6.11 that we started with. The word peace is a new one. So we're going to bring that in when we get to that point, and I'll reference that. Um, but other than that, let's focus now on what he said to flee. He said we are to flee youthful lusts. Now again, put yourself back in this, which is not talking about young kids. We are all children spiritually. Right? Put yourself in here. Satan intentionally targets young people, physically or spiritually, because young people have a lot they haven't experienced, but they deeply want to. Right? I mean, if you look back at, at our growing up, I can look back at mine, and that's always this, ugh. I think one of the most childish and dangerous phrases we can say is, I just have to check that out. Ah. But we do that, physically and spiritually. Useful lusts can include temptations that involve all sorts of things, right? You go carnal pleasures. Worldly achievement, sexual allurement, pride, greed, special knowledge, figuring things out that others haven't. You could go on and on. But Satan knows that if he can get us hooked while we're young, physically or spiritually, he can ruin our whole life. Wouldn't it be nice if our minds were so pure, so focused on God, that we could turn away from all the temptations that pull at us and live pure and blameless before God? Let's turn to another one. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. Here we see Paul again writing, and he's encouraging us to flee from one of the areas that Satan constantly attacks humans in. 1 Corinthians 6 18 says, Flee sexual immorality or sexual sin. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So this concept of sexual desire is one of the most common poles people fight against. It's why Satan throws it in front of us in the media constantly. Reader's Digest tells the story of a man and a woman who were shopping at a busy mall. And remember, Christ said, looking at someone to lust is a violation of this. And so this woman walked by, her, by this woman's husband, and she was in this short, tight-fitting dress, and the man's eyes followed. The wife didn't even need to look up. She said, was it worth the trouble you're in? <laughs> and that's, in a sense, what God is saying. It's saying, flee from anything that takes us down that path. 
wouldn't it be nice if our minds were so pure and so focused on God that even when we might be tempted, we would still overcome because of our love for God and the priorities to glorify Him in our thoughts, in our body, and in our actions? Turn forward a few more chapters. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 14. Another one we've all fallen into. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now you may say, I don't have a shrine in my house. But when we understand what this means, we all fall prey to what it, it represents. Because idolatry is having any false god, any object, any idea, any philosophy, any habit, any occupation, any sport, or whatever that holds our primary loyalty, or anything that decreases our trust in and loyalty to God. We all put things, anytime we put something above God, we've fallen into the potential of idolatry. Remember the command is to flee, not resist. We must not allow anything to come between us and our worship and our service to the one true God. Chuck Swindoll wrote, sometimes it's best to stay away from something for the simple fact that being associated with it could lead you into trouble. As a harmless thought can lead to a heinous sin, so a harmless association could lead to spiritual disaster. Very true. It's keeping that distance. Turn next to John 10 verses 3 through 7. Obviously, John, we're not talking Paul writing this anymore. Now this is Christ using the phrase. And the context is around Christ referencing his sheep, knowing his voice, and listening only to it. John 10 and verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. See, if Christ is our shepherd, and the door for us is his sheep, then he should be the only voice that we listen to. We need to flee from any other voice that tells us to do anything other than what Jesus says should be done. The final example I'll have you turn to is James 4, 7. In essence, this kind of is a synopsis of all of the flee from warnings that are in the Bible, and it tells why we are to do it. James 4 and verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, this... The removal of Satan, if you think about praying thy kingdom come, I find that so often that's a key part of what we're praying for, is that removal of Satan. There's an old parable I read that was from a, a, Haitian, a Haitian pastor. And so this Haitian gentleman told the story of a man who was wanting to sell his house. And he asked $2,000 for the house. Well, there was another man who desperately wanted it. But he couldn't afford more than $1,000. So they bargained back and forth. And finally the man said, okay, I will agree to sell you the house for $1,000. But with that reduced price comes a stipulation. The owner would be able to retain ownership of a large nail that was just above the front door. Okay. Well, several years passed and the original owner then decided he wanted to buy the house back. Well, obviously the new owner wasn't into that, didn't like that concept. So the original owner goes out and finds the carcass of a dead animal and hangs it on the nail right above the front door. Remember the nail that he owns. And in time, it became so unlivable in that house, the stench so bad, the bug so bad, he sold the house back to the first person. And the Haitian pastor concluded the story saying, if we leave the devil with even one small peg in our life, he will return to hang his rotting garbage on it. If the enemy has access to just a single nail in our life, he will exploit it. 
friends, are there any single nails hanging in our life that Satan is able to grab onto? Because if there is, and Satan knows he can take advantage of it, he will. Anything that can cause a Christian leader to fall into sin, we must flee from these things. That's what Paul was saying. So we now transition to the next part of the formula that Paul was teaching to Timothy. And the rest of us, right, as spiritual leaders. We must realize that, that running away from something, running from the wrong things is only part of the plan of, of godliness. Fleeing is critically important, but we can't succeed if we're only running in defense. Separation without positive growth becomes isolation. And Christ did not call us to isolation. That is not what we're supposed to achieve. So while we must flee from what's wrong, we must also run toward what's right. So let me reread 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. It says, But you, O man of God, flee these things, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. So Paul's second instruction to being a spiritual leader is we're measured by what we pursue after. We're measured by what we pursue after. And if we don't cultivate in our lives the characteristics which Paul outlined, then we become known for what we oppose rather than what we propose or what we stand for. We have to stand for something. We're to passionately seek after these items with that same amount of energy that we use to flee from the world. Now here again, the word pursue is in the present imperative. So it gives this indication that it's to be a lifelong pursuit, that we're never to stop pursuing. In other words, we're to make it a goal of our life to achieve these six items and the seventh, remember, peace, that Paul encouraged to pursue in 2 Timothy 2.22. And the reason is it's hard to get a person who is focused on pursuing the right things to turn from those goals. That's why you don't just flee and spend all your time on the defense. When you're focusing toward the right things, you're really locked in on what matters, and it makes you stronger. So let's read through and do a little bit of reflection on each of the items mentioned. First is righteousness. If you want to know the word righteousness, cut it in half, right? We're to do what is right, meaning we're to live a right lifestyle with God. So it's referring to personal integrity. It's referring to character. We're to live a lifestyle that's pleasing to God. The next word used is godliness. And this has to do with godly conduct and our behavior. We're to live a life that reflects the God we follow, like being loving and wise and pure. The next word used is faith. And maybe it's better translated faithfulness. Faith is trust in God which exhibits itself in faithfulness. So you probably know the phrase or the quote, our greatest ability is our dependability. Well, God wants people who will stick at the task of following, of believing, of trusting in him through good times and bad. The next word is love. Love seeks the highest good of the other person, right? This is agape that includes unconditional care for others, a willingness to listen, and the active seeking of their highest good. Love values, respects, and cares about other people, outwardly focused. Next word is patient endurance. And this is the courage and ability to endure even in the toughest times. I read a funny quote that said, by endurance, the snail reached the ark. Right, I don't know if there were snails on the ark or how it got there, but yeah, that would have taken a lot of endurance for that little thing to get up there. The idea is that we should not live in spurts or we shouldn't buckle under the pressure Instead, we should be steadfast. We should seek to move more evenly through life and handle life's demands with stability, with balance, and the strength provided by God. The next word is gentleness. Now, that doesn't mean be a doormat. Let people walk all over you and take advantage of you. Rather, it means keeping your strength under control. Gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is meekness. It's composure to keep strength under control, especially in the face of opposition. And you can think about when Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, learn of me, 
for I am gentle and humble. And the final word that was recommended that we pursue is peace. If you remember, 2 Timothy 2.22 said, Pursue peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, this is in Greek. This isn't the Hebrew word shalom, but a Greek word that implies welfare and living undisturbed. Are you able to keep perspective and inner peace with other believers regardless of what's going on around you? So you remember at the beginning I mentioned that there's a lot of importance to having dependable measurements, right? They're critical. We look at the world around us and how tragic it'd be if they didn't happen. Well, God expects the same from us to become his future spiritual family. If we don't cultivate these seven characteristics of God's spirit, well, then there's going to be a void on the positive side of our character. There should, they should form a foundation of a God-honored life. And so we reflect Jesus Christ and how we live by being a person that exemplifies love and righteousness and godliness and faith and patient endurance, peace and gentleness, rather than just being people who don't do bad things. So how are we doing? How are we doing at building these qualities? Wherever you or I might be lacking, you can almost hear Paul saying, well, get going, get running. Pursue these godly traits immediately. Don't delay. Seeking these seven traits is critical. And we can't just say, I like five of them best. I'm going to seek five of them. And yeah, the other two aren't that important. We were unable to do a visual, um, but I can give, send somebody later if you would like. One of the things that struck me as I was going through this is the similarity between the flea statements and the Ten Commandments. And so if you can picture, I'll kind of talk you through what the visual would show, but picture three columns. One is going to be the Ten Commandments. The middle one is going to be the flee from statements. But we also don't always think from, you know, do not do this. Well, what do you do? The pursues are almost a contrasting opposite to it. So you could start with, you shall worship no other gods. Well, we were told, flee from voice, voices other than the great shepherd, right? Instead, we should pursue faith and love. Second commandment, you should not make yourself a graven image, bow down or serve them. Well, we're to flee from idolatry. We're to pursue godliness. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Again, it, we're told submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We're to pursue righteousness. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Flee from voices other than the great shepherd. Learn to only hear his voice. Pursue righteousness and pursue faith. Honor your father and your mother. Again, who is our greatest father? God the Father. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Pursue righteousness. You shall not commit murder. Well, we've been told, and this is a verse I didn't have you, when we, we didn't go through uh, for time, but Matthew 3, 7 through 9. It says, flee the wrath to come and bear fruits worthy of repentance, right? Pursue peace. You shall not commit adultery. I'm sorry. No, that's right. That's the next one. You shall not commit adultery. Well, obviously, flee from sexual immorality was the one we reviewed. Pursue love and gentleness, which is having us treat a person in a much more respectful way. You shall not steal. Well, we read the love of money is something we should flee from, greed as well as useful, youthful lusts. Instead, pursue patience. That patience endures, not wanting it now. You shall not bear false witness. Again, that very much links to fleeing from idolatry, because usually when you're lying, you're trying to get to something you're putting as a higher priority. Pursue godliness, godliness and you shall not covet. Again, the love of money is something we should flee from. So it's just an interesting perspective along the way to see the links. We're commanded to flee from all that conforms to the world and selfish desires and justifications. And we're commanded to pursue and hold on to what makes us holy. That's our goal. That's what this journey of life is about. Now, again, that doesn't mean living in isolation. Because we were called to go into the world, just not conform to it. 
That's Christ's example. We are to be radically different in our conduct, not just in parts of our life. Well, we also pick some other things in society and say, ah, I don't like those two things. That's what we're learning. And still, instead, God says, be you holy, for I am holy. Christ set the example, and he gave us the commission, right? To go into the world, but not conform to it and avoid the sin. So let's continue to the third character trait. And I'm going to reread 1 Timothy 6.12 this time, and um, we will see what else we should follow after, after we've fled from the things he tells us to flee from, and pursue after the things he tells us to pursue. And this section is going to link very closely to Mr. Conway's message. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So a spiritual leader is measured by what they fight for. A spiritual leader is measured by what they fight for. Paul's phrase, fight the good fight, that's part of our vernacular, isn't it now, in the English language? And it often is used as to hang in there and whatever you're going through. But we get our English word agony from the Greek word that's used here for fight. Agonizomai agonizom, ag, or something like that. But so literally what Paul is saying is agonize the good agony. <laughs> It's a phrase that's used with sports, with military, and it's describing this concentration, this discipline, and the extreme effort that's needed to win. And of course, when it says the faith, it's talking about biblical truth. We are to fight to hold on to biblical truth. So, when Paul wrote this, even in the verses before, he's talking about false teachers trying to lead people astray. And they were pointing people to false gospels, which, of course, aren't gospels at all. And so Timothy was being told to stand for the truth, proclaim it with all his, his force. And he's informing us that in every step of the way in our journey, you and I are going to have to do the same, right? There are going to be things that we will have to, confight, to fight to contend with in our journey of growing to be spiritual leaders, to be all the... God has called us to be. But it can be one. Remember also that back when Paul wrote these words, confessing your faith was all usually linked with baptism, right? But that very act of baptism was considered politically subversive by the Roman government. After all, you were being, by being baptized, you were aligning yourself with this group of people that were considered fanatical. They were dangerous. So a good confession carried the risk of losing everything, including being imprisoned, martyred. And if you think about what happened, it wasn't many years after Paul was already in prison. He was martyred following the exact same things he warned about. And that's why in the next verses, Paul points Timothy and us as readers to Christ's example. Verse 13, I urge you in the sight of God who gives light life to all things and before Christ Jesus who set us the example through how he witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until our Lord Jesus appearing excuse me see we're to always look to Jesus Christ as our example the Greek word translated appearing in verse 14 is actually the word we get epiphany from um, which means a glorious display, a revelation. But Jesus is always our source to find hope and encouragement and strength. And so two examples are mentioned here. One is we can look back to his physical life, how he stood up to, stood before Pilate, right? Or we can look forward to find hope until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Apostle Paul in verse 15 continues and he starts talking about the awesomeness of God that helps encourage us too. It says, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So we're 
to hold on to the gospel, to the good news of the kingdom of God, closely, securely, and we're to keep it protected and safe in our lives until Christ's return. That's what we're fighting for. That's the priority. And this treasure of this message has been entrusted to every one of us. That's the treasure that's being referenced here. And that treasure isn't something that we just hold. It's something we're supposed to share. Again, it talks about we're not supposed to live in isolation. It's not something we keep locked away in a safe or even imprisoned in the four walls of a church. We are to share that treasure with other people. And that's part of the commission of the church. Turn to Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 13. We're going to read some, some of the same verses that Mr. Conway referenced. But hopefully it adds on what he shared as well. Now, it's interesting that Paul exhorts us to fight after, just encouraging us to be gentle and seek peace. <laughs> you catch that? So is there a contrast there? Absolutely not. Paul is not describing an attitude of being quarrelsome, but an attitude of struggling against all odds to keep one's faith secure, to keep it strong, to keep it growing. So let me reread a section that we heard in the sermonette. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That is what our fight is against. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day. Flee from pursue, fight the fight, and do all to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. See, just before the Battle of Trafalgar, you know the name of the British naval hero, hero Lord Nelson, he learned that one of his admirals and one of his captains were not on good terms. And so he brought them into his, his office, and he put both their hands together, and then he had them look out the window and he said, look, yonder is your enemy. Every generation must contend for the truth. We must know who our true enemy is and who our battle is with. And it's with Satan. Every generation brings lies into the church or false doctrines and different people thinking, oh, I've come up with something exciting and different. And we, as Christian leaders, what we're called to be, must stand for the truth. We must fight the good fight of faith. Turn now to 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Do you ever find yourself focusing on the imperfections of other Christians, of the church, and make that the focus of our battle, rather than uniting against the division and the fractures that Satan tries to incite. Because that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to pull magnifying glasses on each other. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the abundance, um, to the obedience of Christ. So Satan and the demons are adversaries that if we could see them would terrify us. But we don't walk by what we see. We are to walk with confidence. We are to trust in the Lord. And that's what we're being encouraged. A godly person is measured by what we fight for. Are we fighting for the right things? We need to make sure that we're engaged in the right contest, the right battles, fighting the Lord's battles, the good fight of faith. We must not let ourselves become disconnected and isolated, even from within the house of God, because that's where we're to gain strength from each other as brothers. We collectively need to stay at our battle stations, do the right things, things like, and we could go on and on, but I mean, a couple of them I wrote down, fighting the battle for personal holiness, fighting to be an example in our family or in our church or in our community, 
fighting for a strong faith, fighting through the challenges of living in a fallen world, right? We could go around the room and add things to that, that list. I'd like to conclude this message. Uh, Paul gave Timothy what I would see as some amazing advice. Very simple, very straightforward, very practical to apply that we can all learn from because we are all called to be spiritual leaders. A spiritual leader is measured by what they flee from. A spiritual leader is measured by what they pursue after. And a spiritual leader is measured by what they fight for. Near the end of Paul's life, a very well-known scripture, Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 7 said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Wouldn't we all want to be able to say those words at the end of our lives? as it approaches. Well, it comes down to the fact that we will all be measured by what we flee from, what we follow after, and what we fight for.